slide, now that your poster is finished, how can you stand in front of the audience and give the poster presentation? And so as I said in class, each of you got various grades or what have you. And so what I wanna do now is demonstrate what I expected of each of you. This is what I wanted to do in class that I just haven't done yet. So I'm using this as an opportunity to do it. All right, and so if I were attempting to be Brandon or a member of your group, clearly my name is on here. So I should be able to articulate what's important about this. And so I'm about to switch and not be myself, but then be the person that's presenting this as a poster. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, and then I'll walk through, once I'm finished, I'll walk through kind of the characteristics that makes a good poster presentation, okay? So, typically persons would be walking up. They will be kind of just walking past, so it will be a room full of posters, and posters will be all spread around, and the person that's presenting would stand next to their poster, okay? And they're literally just waiting for someone in the audience to walk by. And so when someone approaches you, I'm gonna pretend that someone is standing in front of me that's approaching you. Um, typically what you would do, you would introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Dr. Paige Anderson, and this fall, I have uh, my students doing a course-based undergraduate research experience. The title of the course is CPHES. It stands for Science Education Alliance. Phage Hunters Evolutionary, no, Advancing Genomic Evolutionary Sciences. So that's what CPHES stands for. And the point of this class is that it's a two semester class. So in the fall, there's a component, and in the spring, there's a component. In the fall, what students would typically do is do a wet lab exercise where they go out in the environment, they collect soil samples, and hopefully by the end of the semester, every student that's participating would have isolated a, vi um, a virus from the soil. And in the spring semester, the class would work together to uh, sequence a particular virus and hopefully find out some new information and be able to compare that virus to some other, other sequences that have already been determined. And so what this particular poster is about today is the history of the CPHES program. So if you walk around today, you'll actually see three posters that's represented by our class. This one is the history of the CPHES course. There's another group that's presenting about the methods that we're gonna use in this course. And then there's a third group that kind of summarizes where we are and what we'd like to accomplish. So for this one, it is the history of the CPHES course and what's important for you to know is that the CPHES program has been around for, um, has been around since 2008. And the data that's reflected on this poster is just on the first five years. And so um, in terms of orienting you to the topic, as I mentioned, it's a course-based undergraduate research experience. And that's very important because it's very difficult to get students engaged in research at small universities like Virginia Union. Typically the opportunities for research are very limited and so if you can do it as part of a classroom, you're more likely to get more exposure where more people can be involved. And so that's what this course attempts to do. It was designed and supported by Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So that was the, the organization that developed the program. And since its inception, CPHES is present on about 100 campuses throughout the United States. The purpose is for students to explore this huge population of what's called bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. And um, the curriculum itself wants to um, ensure that students have strong research method skills. They know how to approach um, research. They know the experimental design. And they know how to interpret data as a result of participating. And typically, the class size for any CPHES course is about 18 to 24 students. In this first panel here, it just shows the diversity of the types of universities that has adopted this course. So most of the universities are at research universities. I'm not sure if you would do that now, but this is what you would do at your university. We would point you to the poster. Um, the research universities, there's about 30 schools. Um, again, this is the first five years of the program. So it has the most, but I guess I wanted to emphasize that the next five um, number of universities are baccalaureate institutions just like Virginia Union. So even though it's a challenge to get students involved in research at institutions like Virginia Union, through this course, we're aiming to target and have students on par with those that are graduating from the research-intensive universities. 
The next is, in this panel, uh, over the first five years, the, the organizers of this course did a survey of, from all the students who participated from all across the country. And they asked students, what do you think about your research skills? Do you think you'll have a career in science? Do you think you've learned something as a result of participating in this course? Do you think you can do this? You know, how confident are you? And it compared that survey from students who did research in the summer, students who did research in the CPHES course, students who worked one-on-one -on -one with faculty members, and the red dots are all of the cases or all of the responses from the CPHES. And as you can see, it's higher in all of the cases that was tested. That's an indication that the students who participated in the CPHES course, their confidence is super high as compared to those who did research in other ways. So that's really important because if we're gonna do that here at Virginia Union, we wanna make sure our students are confident about what it is that they're doing as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, down here is just a summary of the number of phages that's been isolated over that first five year period. And as you can see, if you just look at the colors, you know, without even knowing what they represent, every year there's an increase, increase, increase. What these data show us is that every year that this course has been going on, students that's been involved, they've been isolating more and more and more and more phages, which informs the scientific community about the range of viruses that are present, how they um, compare to one another, it really is a huge tool where students are contributing to the science. So these students are publishing their work. These are freshman students who are getting a chance to publish the work that they do, which is really unheard of. And then lastly over here is just another measure of how this course impacts students um, in terms of their education and retention. Certainly here at Virginia Union, retention is a big issue. Retention is whether or not a student's returned the next year. So students come, then they leave for whatever reason. And so retention is a huge emphasis where we wanna make sure we retain our students and they come back year after year. So here's some retention data. It's just a bar graph and it shows at a wide number of schools who've implemented this course, on average, there's about 50% of students who return every year. Um, for students who are in the traditional science laboratory classes, they are not retained much. They may not just leave the university, but they might even change their major. But as you can see, for all students who participate in that CPHES course, the retention is much higher because these students are seeing the value in how it uh, facilitates their education. And then certainly on this panel, the blue bars represent the grades. And so at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that, but it says A, B, C, and D, and F. The blue is the grades of the students who were not doing CPHES. The red is the grades of the students who were doing CPHES. And hopefully you can see that even though the course is probably more difficult, students actually are, uh, um, achieve higher because of the rigor associated with it. They're interested in it, they're going with it. And so in summary, what our group was charged to do was to do a historical perspective of this class just to show and communicate to the uh, Virginia Union community that we are doing this type of work it's been going on for almost 10 years now. Again, this is data for five years. Um, but what we wanna do at Virginia Union is make sure that our students are having the same types of experiences that are going on all over the country. Right. So, then you would stop, okay? I don't know how long this has been going on, but maybe about five to 10 minutes. You get what I'm saying? So, here are the characteristics for how you give a good poster presentation. The first thing you do is you go and you introduce yourself. You shake their hand, okay? You let them know, hi, I'm such and such, I'm this uh, classification, I'm this major, and this is what I've been working on, or this is what I've wor we're working on for this academic year. So you introduce yourself. The second thing that you do is you literally walk the audience through what the poster represents, okay? You should not be reading off the poster, but you should reference the poster because the information that's on the poster should remind you of what it is that you should say. So having little index cards and notes to remind you is really not beneficial for the student, okay? Because that judge or that audience member that's gonna be evaluating you, one of the components is,
how do you engage with them? Are you ver how you conversational? Are you comfortable? Okay, that's what they're going to be evaluating you on. And if you're not looking at them because you're reading the entire time, or because you're reading what's going on up here, you might not be received as favorable. Okay, so you would have access to your poster before. You should practice giving that spiel, that five to 10 minute walkthrough. And then once you're there on that day, keep in mind that people might interrupt you, okay? And that's okay too. So even though I walk through everything, there's really no person standing in front of me. But as I was giving the talk, it should be a conversation with you in the audience. So they may say, oh, okay, that's interesting. You only highlighted the research universities and the bachelor's grading degree institutions, but they have this at associate degree programs as too, so two-year colleges. And you can say, actually, they do. I mean, you know, it's not to the same extent, but some uh, two-year granting it to community colleges are doing this course as well. And then you just would go on to the next thing it was that you were attempting to say. So giving a poster presentation is not like an oral where someone has to stand there and wait until you finish, okay? As you're talking, they may interrupt you a bit, and that's fine. You answer the question, and then you keep going, okay? And then, uh, so my advice, introduce yourself, proceed to walk through the poster, okay? Five to 10 minutes. Understand that you might be interrupted, okay? But there might be a judge that might not interrupt you at all, and they might let you stand there and proceed through and our judges will have access to your poster before that day, okay? So they, depending upon their timing, they might not even want you to walk through the whole thing. They might come up to you and say, I've looked through your poster already, I'm really interested about what it is that you have going on, and I have a question about this. So they might not even want you to walk through the whole thing because they have already reviewed your poster, and so those people may exist as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so let me pause it. Are there any questions so far? I have one. Okay. So feel free, feel free, because I want to make sure that it's valuable for you, right? So what I hope, what I hope I'm doing today is decreasing some of the anxiety of what may happen at a poster presentation. Yes. It's Professional, okay, because this is how people communicate and research. They have a poster and they stand in front of it. So your attire matters as well. So you want to make sure you should be comfortable. So if, you know, for gentlemen, if, you know, dress shoes aren't your thing and your dress shoes hurt your feet, you probably don't want to wear those dress shoes on that day for two hours. And for ladies, you know, if, if you're constantly having to readjust that skirt all day, that's probably not the skirt it is that you want to have because how you engage with a person matters, right? If you're talking to them the whole time and you're adjusting for whatever reason, that kind of looks a little weird. It's like distracting, okay? So in terms of your attire, I think business casual is appropriate. I don't think you need to be professional, okay? You can be, all right? But it's not required. My thing is you should be comfortable. The more comfortable you are, the more you're able to relax about what it is that you don't feel comfortable, you might be extra nervous because maybe you're dressing in a way that you typically do. Um, sure, is it just one person looking or is it a... Oh, that's a audience? great question. So this is what happens. Initially, it'll start out slow and you might have one person because students are going to be the audience, the judges are going to be the audience, you may have some professors as the audience, and everyone is like just walking around looking. So they might be looking for the particular poster that they're judging, or they might be looking for a poster that grabs their interest, okay? As you speak to one person, another person may come, and another person may come. It will not be uncommon that as you're in the middle of giving the presentation, you may have five people in front of you. And then the other piece is, if they weren't there from the beginning, the one you started talking to, they will have heard the whole story. But the last person who came up, maybe they came up when you were right here and you were almost done. They may then ask you a question about something you've already said. And that's okay too because they weren't there. 
So it is a, the poster presentation is from six to eight. Okay, it's from six to eight. We will start at six, okay? And then about 625, 630 or so, whenever the administration arrives, whether it's the president or vice president or whom that, um, whichever representative shows up, we will pause, okay? We will have a welcome from those representatives who come. There'll be a discussion about why this was important, why you're there, um, kind of what's happened. We'll acknowledge the people and the organizations who supported our event. That would probably only take maybe like 10 to 15 minutes, if that. Then we'll go back to the, the networking and the poster challenge. And then there'll be um, food available, like hors d'oeuvres available. Yes. Um, so, have you ever been, okay, so like the people that's not food making, are we supposed to be here? Yeah, I'm gonna tell, so I'm gonna tell my class. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell my class, oh, I see your hand in one second. So, my class in particular, so yes, my class should be there to support our peers, okay? Your name is on this poster, right? Everybody in my class has their name associated with some poster. So while Brandon might be presenting, you know, maybe Jeff or you are standing right on the side and someone to ask a question but doesn't want to interrupt Brandon, you all can be there to answer. You're just not presenting. Do you get what I'm saying? But also, I'm going to tell you all as a class, if you go and summarize somebody else's work, that'll be a seminar opportunity for you too. So it'll be a value added for both. Yes, ma'am. Oh, was that your question? Yes. And I have to consider how many you can do to get credit and stuff like that, but I'll make that announcement in class so everyone knows. But yes, go in, you should be fine. Um, just in terms of what people typically do, uh, whether it be at Virginia Union or you go to a regional meeting or a national meeting, Sometimes students prints out a small version of their poster, like on a regular size piece of, piece of paper. If you go to like print option, you can click a box that says uh, fit to slide or fit to paper roll or something like that. And it'll take all of this and put it on a regular size sheet of paper. And then they print that. And sometimes they do that because they wanna hand out the poster to different people who may be interested. So you don't know who's gonna walk into the room. Just in our immediate Richmond area, we know VCU has a class about this as well. Who knows if that professor is in the audience, they may, they may wanna see your poster and ask you, can you have a copy or something like that. So that's why we include the contact information of both the student and the project mentor, because you never know who might wanna reach out to you after you finish, and so you include that. Um, also, sometimes people, student presenters have um, business cards. So if you are doing an awesome job, you're giving your presentation, you're articulate, giving your ideas, someone may come and say, oh my goodness, you know, what are your plans for the summer? Or what, are you interested in a job? Like you might not even recognize that you're interviewing for something that you didn't even know you were doing. So we've invited like the community idea station, they came to our event in the spring, and they were looking for students to be featured on one of their TV shows or a commercial or something. So you never know who's in the audience, right? And so sometimes they're like, oh, you know, you did a really good job. How would you like to do this in another way? So understand that you're always marketing yourself to. You don't know who you're talking to, so you wanna make sure you So it's going to be judged because there's a competition, okay? The, the judging is for students winning resources to help them with their project. Uh, our alumni association will serve as judges. So I like for students to know that it's a very welcoming judging experience. Um, we do have some alum who take this judging thing very seriously. And so they might ask you more questions than you would anticipate, but that's because they really are wanting you to do a good job and they're really genuinely interested. So just anecdotally, last spring, um, a pre 
law student was giving a poster about some work that she'd done uh, regarding, I forget the debate. Was it client confidentiality? Confidentiality, yeah, or something like that. Like, should attorneys uh, feel like they can discuss everything or should they just keep it close? Or it was some kind of debate nonetheless. There was an attorney as a judge. She didn't know. So she's presenting her debate or her argument for why confidentiality should or should not be the case in different contexts. And so this attorney now that's judging her kind of challenges some of the things that she's saying because he works in this capacity. So you never know how that might happen. Um, and they ended up talking for like 30 minutes. It was like that person just stayed there the whole time and so that might happen um, as well too. And so, have you got your final copies back yet? No. No. Yeah. Uh, is that because we were good? Like, did we already approve it? Yeah, so I think, I think are you said. Jenkins Thomas? Yeah. Is that his name? Um, yeah, so she resubmitted. Uh -huh. So I'm still going through okay. the resubmission. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, we got it, though. Okay. Good, good. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, is the updated one on here or no? Yeah, the one she resubmitted is on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we haven't gone through that yet? my students can see that just not signing people are doing this. Mm -hmm. It's all confidential, but not that. This is Taylor's uh, poster. And most of these, I guess you can't see the title. It just, what she wants to know is, does social media replace public relations practitioners? So she's a, are you a journalist? public relations major and that's a major concern for her in her field right like so she's working in a field where social media is kind of invading on their space <laughs> okay and she wants to know how is that going to affect her there's no answer to that question right now but she's developed a project that seeks to try to answer that question does that make sense and so she'll stand up there in the same I, I, I would use yours as an I know it might be your first time or, or whoever. Um, feel free to kind of just walk us through it and I'll give you feedback. Okay. Um, so, hi, my name is Taylor Jenkins Thompson. Um, I'm a graduating senior uh, with a major in mass communications and computational public relations. Um, and my poster is basically asking do you need the social media skills to, in order to improve on your public relations abilities? Um, and public relations basically is making sure that your, your client or your company is